I would like to introduce the ancient Egyptian depictions the series has. As most of you may know, much of Yu-Gi-Oh's concepts in the original series were tied to ancient Egypt. The ancient times of Egypt were said to hold incredible power and wisdom, most of which has been lost to the sands of time. Many of the world's secrets were left behind in the past and flash forward to the present time, we are left with the remains of the said great civilization. Yu-Gi-Oh seek to fill in some of those gaps in its own magical way, in a way true to the author Kazuki Takahashi. Although the story is a fictitious work by Takahashi, the series had a slew of references from ancient Egypt. Takahashi did a great job in infusing mythology, history, and the wisdom of ancient Egypt into Yu-Gi-Oh and he doesn't get enough credit for it. Takahashi even went as far as to visit Egypt for research and you can tell that Takahashi and his team knew what they were doing. Let's go through a few examples so we can better understand and appreciate his work. First up is Exodia, the Forbidden One, one of the most iconic cards in the game. Exodia is based off the god Osiris, who symbolized the underworld, death, and resurrection. In Egyptian mythology, Osiris had his body parts chopped off and scattered to different places. He was later put back together with some help. All of this is strikingly similar to Exodia in how there are separate cards that you must summon to bring Exodia whole. Furthermore, Exodia cards can be summoned from the graveyard at times, further relating to death and resurrection, which is what Osiris governs. Speaking of incredibly powerful gods, the Egyptian god cards all have references as well. They are all related to certain Egyptian gods. These cards aren't exactly gods, but rather they are more so monsters of the gods, and so they do resemble them. The simplest one is the winged dragon of Ra which references the king of deities, sun god Ra through name. Ra was depicted to have a falcon head, and so the winged dragon of Ra does resemble more of a falcon or a phoenix head, rather than one of a dragon. Ra was also known to have different forms that represent the different times of the day, and so you could say that the Ra cards represent his different forms. In the morning, Ra took the shape of a Kepri, a scarab beetle, and that is symbolic of the sphere mode card. During the day, Ra took on a human form and even had a falcon head, which again is similar to the regular winged dragon of Ra look. During the evening, Ra took on the form of an old man. This doesn't match with the three winged dragon of Ra cards we have, so maybe you can say that it is reminiscent of Ra's disciple, as it is most symbolic to a regular old man. Finally, during the night, Ra would travel to the underworld, to the realm of the dead, and be reborn, and that is reminiscent of the phoenix form, which is special summoned from the graveyard, as well as the phoenix's nature to rise from the ashes to be born again. Next up is Slifer the Sky Dragon, which was called the Sky Dragon of Osiris in the Japanese version, with it of course referencing Osiris through name. You could also say that Slifer's design is symbolic of serpent gods, Mehen and Apep, both of which are related to Ra. Mahen was considered to be Ra's protector when Ra voyaged through the underworld. It was also said that Mahen was the guardian of Osiris' corpse, protecting his body after death. This could help explain why the card was initially called Sky Dragon of Osiris in the Japanese version, before it was later changed into Slifer, the name of an executive of Yu-Gi-Oh, to distance the card from its Egyptian roots. On the other hand, the other serpent god, Apep, was considered to be Ra's enemy, seeking to swallow Ra in his voyage to the underworld, and even being dubbed as the Lord of Chaos. It was said that Ra engaged in many battles with Apep, as well as with other gods who aided Ra, including Set. Finally, we have Obelisk the Tormentor, which is called Giant Divine Soldier of Obelisk in Japanese. Obelisks are religious monuments of ancient Egypt. This one is a little harder to connect, but the card could refer to the god Set. Set was the god who chopped up the body of Osiris, so it makes sense that the god cards will be based on the two prominent gods. Furthermore, the card could be symbolic of Set, who is associated with violence and chaos. Funny enough, the character who had Obelisk the Tormentor was Seto Kaiba, whose first name has Set in it. Kaiba himself has violent and brutal cards that suit his personality as mentioned earlier. 
Furthermore, the high priest Seto betrayed the pharaoh and revolted against him, which could be related to Set betraying Osiris, and so perhaps Takahashi was aiming for a connection to Set with these characters. Yugi having Slifer, the card representing Osiris, would also further this connection. There were a bunch of other characters with references to God's names, with some being Sacred Phoenix of Nepotus, Sebek's Blessing, and Horus, the Black Flame Dragon. Speaking of Horus, the series also had the Eye of Horus, which showed up countless times in Yu-Gi-Oh. This is an Egyptian symbol of protection and well-being. Even Atom is a reference of the deity Atom, who was one of the first gods in Egyptian mythology. It was said that he created the world out of chaos with his own magic. The next symbolic reference would be the principles of Mahat. Mahat is an Egyptian goddess and Mahat is also a card that wields all seven of the millennium items. There are also seven concepts to Mahat. And so what I'm trying to get to is that the seven millennium items could very well represent the various concepts. Some items also have their own references to Egyptian mythology outside the principles of Mahat. The seven principles of Mahat are truth, balance, order, harmony, law, morality, and justice. As for the seven millennium items, they are the millennium puzzle, eye, ring, scale, key, rod, and necklace. The concepts aren't direct fits with all the items, so this is more of an incomplete theory, but we will go through it regardless and try to match the items with the concepts. First up we have Truth, which could correspond with the Millennium Eye, as that allows you to read minds and look into a person's soul, pretty much allowing you to see the truth. This could also be symbolic of the Eye of Horus. The Millennium Key also allows you to enter a person's mind slash soul, but this allows you to change it. For that reason, it could be a good fit for harmony, as it allows you to rearrange things to create harmony within a soul. This item takes the shape of an Ankh. The Ankh is considered to be the Egyptian symbol of life. Next, we will discuss order. This could be represented by the Millennium Rod, as the rod seems like something a ruler would wield, and the pharaohs often held them. Furthermore, order is what a ruler strives to bring. The item allows for mind control as well as the ability to seal monsters, so it does fit well with order. As for justice, the scale will fit well with it. A weighing scale is often used to represent justice, from ancient times to present times. In ancient Egyptian mythology, it was said that when someone died, their heart was put on a scale and weighed against the feather of Mahat by Anubis, the god of death. This was also done in the Yu-Gi-Oh series. In mythology, if the heart was heavier, it meant the person committed crimes, and it would subsequently be eaten by Amit, the destroyer, a goddess with a crocodile head, body of a lion, and the bottom of a hippopotamus. The three animals Amit represented were considered to be the largest man-eating animals, and when a meat would eat a heart, it would doom the person's soul to the underworld forever. Funny enough, a meat shows up in Yu-Gi-Oh as well, during the use of the Millennium Scale, with the difference being that the guilty person is instead devoured whole. The Millennium Scale could also fit with law, balance, and even morality, so this can be moved around. The next three are a little harder to fit in with the remaining principles. With the Millennium Necklace, maybe law or morality would be a good fit, as it allows you to see into the past and future. This gives you the ability to judge who is right or wrong, and even learn from other times, helping you acquire morality. The Millennium Ring allows the user to find whatever they want, and so this is a tough one to place. The ring also contains the souls of dark beings, and it could turn on the user to harm them. Finally, we have the Millennium Puzzle, which unlocks the Dark Shadow games. The hieroglyphics engraved on the puzzle says, The one who solves me shall gain the powers and knowledge of darkness. The puzzle also grants your wishes and gives you better odds to win. The Millennium Puzzle is based on a pyramid, which is synonymous with Egypt. This could maybe fit with balance, as the puzzle contains both good and bad aspects to it, and you can say the same about the Millennium Ring. Which items fit the best with each principle? This theory may not be a perfect fit, but I'll leave it to you all to figure it out. Takahashi also introduced ancient Egyptian concepts of the soul to his series. We saw that with Ba, Ka, not to be confused with Baka. Ka. 
I don't want to hear another word. You're a disgrace to the game. As we see in the panel here, Takahashi infused these concepts into ancient duo monsters. The Ba and Ka were only a few components of the soul, with all of them being displayed here. While I won't go through every one of them, I do want you to keep Shadow in mind, as I'll be talking about that later. The last reference to history and mythology I will talk about in this section is an interesting one that could have perhaps inspired Yu-Gi-Oh! and its Shadow games. This was a story about Pharaoh Ramses II's son, Prince Setna. Setna, a prized scholar and magician, was in search for the Book of Thoth, an ancient set of scrolls set to hold incredible power. He, alongside his brother Anuru, would come to the tomb of Nefrekepta to uncover the scroll. In the tomb, Setna would come across a soul that warned him not to take the Book of Thoth, as Nefrekepta took it before him and as a result, his life was ruined with sorrow and misfortune. Setna would disregard the soul's warning, and state that he would take the book by force if needed. In response, the soul would agree to give the book if Setna would prevail in a game. They would play 52, an Egyptian board game. Setna would lose and every time he lost, he would sink deeper into the ground. Eventually, all of his body but his head was covered in sand. This was reminiscent of the Shadow Games from Yu-Gi-Oh! where contestants play games with dire consequences. Setna would eventually prevail in the game, as he would ask his brother for the amulet of Puta, and through it, he propelled himself up, stole the book and ran off. In response, the spirit would say Setna would come back to him on his knees, begging for forgiveness to return the book. This would end up happening as Setna would have some terrifying dreams depicting the destruction of his family from his own hands and through the guidance of his father the pharaoh, he would return the book just as the spirit said. To make amends, Setna would bring over the bodies of the spirit's family to Nefrekepta's tomb and he would be forgiven by the spirit. The tomb was then buried so that none may ever find it. The shadow games in Yu-Gi-Oh often had one side that needed to be humbled and taught a lesson and in this case, that is what happened with Setna. I don't know if this story inspired Takahashi or what exactly inspired him to create the series, but I felt it was a cool story that I should include in this video. All of this is honestly just an introduction to all the mythological and historical references in Yu-Gi-Oh. The rabbit hole goes deep, and I'm sure there's plenty of more material out there related to this topic. The amazing part of this is that I am confident that Yu-Gi-Oh was riddled with even more references that have yet to be brought into light. The point I wanted to make was that Yu-Gi-Oh is incredibly underrated in this aspect, and a lot of time and energy must have gone into it. I personally never knew any of this as a kid, which is understandable, but knowing it now adds a lot of depth to the series, and I'm sure it must have inspired many to learn more about the ancient Egyptian civilizations and mythologies. With the Egyptian references now done, let's now discuss some notable themes of the series. 